We're test flying the new Delta Flyer Junior, its parent having been kaboomed by the Borg recently. Paris thinks this involves things like flying at speed through densely packed asteroids, because Tom Paris is sometimes still a dick. The fancy flying has attracted an admirer, though. Another ship pops over and compliments ours, then challenges us to a bit of a race. Obviously, a logical and emotionally balanced Starfleet officer would never allow themselves to be goaded into a situation that could be a trap. Unfortunately, we've got Paris, so he ignores Kim, just like the writers have for six years, and zooms after them. The Delta Flyer Junior has a new turbo mode, because of course it does, and they catch up with their challenger, who seems to have developed some engine problems. We teleport the pilot over, and in between coughs, they challenge us to a rematch. Sounds like they'll be hanging around for the episode, so let's spin the final season's inaugural Wheel of Names. If you're new here, then patrons can volunteer names for the wheel, and if we meet someone interesting on our travels, we might let RNGesus slap a name on them. Racing Pilot's new name is... Alien McBumpy Nose, offered by Commander Mark Sharp. The wheel works in mysterious ways, Mark. You may have won the spin, but on one of the few alien species without a bumpy nose. I guess there's probably a moral in there somewhere about gambling. Anywho, that race rematch isn't going to happen any time soon with Alien McBumpy Nose's ship in its current state, so we all pop back to Voyager for repairs. Balana's badgering the dog for his holodeck time, something he'd already planned to use learning how to play golf. She's managed to arrange the weekend off with Paris and wants to spend it in a holiday programme with him. It's taken a great many favours, and the doc reluctantly agrees to donate his time to her cause. I imagine she'd be terribly upset if something got in the way of it after all that work. Down in the shuttle bay, Kim and Alien McBumpynose are working inside her ship. Well, she's working while he sits around pining for her, because apparently that's his defining characteristic now. Paris interrupts with the news that her engine's fixed now, and compliments it too, but says it's odd for the sublight engines to be so good on a ship which has such terrible warp speed. That's because the race course doesn't need it, she says, and Paris's ears prick up at the news. It's a short rally, Paris and Kim are telling Janeway, and one that prohibits faster-than-light travel. Sure, entering the Delta Flyer Junior will take some resources and work, but this is a cultural exchange with lots of different species. To the surprise of Paris, she agrees. It's a chance for us to do a diplomacy whilst also having some downtime for the crew. Just as well we didn't have anything else planned this weekend, isn't it? A chance encounter with the dock's flashing green balls sparks a conversation, reminding Paris of his scheduling fuck-up and likely impending death. But the expected explosion doesn't come. He explains that he can withdraw from the race, whilst also making it very clear that he doesn't want to, and would use it as a cudgel against her in every argument for the next decade. She accepts the news with a level of tired resignation that would spark most people's sense of self-preservation, but Paris is apparently unable to see it. He buggers off to make plans, and leaves Balana to deal with her disappointment alone. It's so upsetting that she's even willing to be in the same room as Neelix, he feigns a reason to sit down so he can be the ship's counsellor once more, and Balana opens up about doubting whether she and Paris are truly compatible. Neelix guides her towards looking at the fun times, but that's just it. Paris is all about the fun times. There have even been occasions where it's involved her. Neelix suggests that perhaps she should be saying these things to Paris so they can see if they have a future, and if not, well, there's always Ensign Conspicuous. He's got another shagger season coming in about four years. The way things are going, that race may not happen at all. We're chatting to an ambassador about our entry when he receives a call. The participants in the race, who until recently were engaged in a century-long war, haven't quite got over their disagreements yet. Decisions on who gets to host the race festivities are being seen by all parties as a potential show of favouritism, and the whole thing's in danger of just falling on its ass. Just as well that we have an independent third party who'll be willing to host all gatherings on the neutral ground of their spaceship, Pretty fucking brave to stick so many former enemies together on Voyager, given our, let's say, relaxed approach to security matters, but Tuvok isn't there to argue, so it's happening. And that's why we're having a little party in the mess hall. Paris and Kim have new uniforms, which, somehow, manage to make them look like both waiters and mechanics. It's an improvement over the flight suit from Alice, I guess, but then so is a funeral shroud. Alien McBumpy Nose points out another racer, a former fighter pilot, and tells us to keep an eye on him. 
ever one for subtlety, Paris just goes over and introduces himself. Long, dark and brooding has little patience for Paris's bullshit, and he leaves having learned nothing beyond the fact that he's not the only dick on Voyager anymore. Down in Astromatrix, Balana's still pissed, but trying to get on with work. Unfortunately, everybody else seems interested in the race. Even Seven's trying to plot the most efficient route, something that takes Balana by surprise, until Seven explains that trying to be interested in the activities of colleagues can help morale. Why, that almost sounds like an idea. Which is why Balana's wearing the ugly jumpsuit as she boards the Delta Flyer Jr. Paris is initially confused, but Balana explains that she was pissed off with him until she decided that they could make this a joint activity instead. That feels a lot like placating a toddler to me, but it's her life, I guess. Besides, she's chief engineer, so it's technically an upgrade. Paris seems happy with the situation, which may be partly relief at still breathing, and we fly over to the starting line. After some words from the ambassador and a wasted firework to mark the start, we're off. The Delta Flyer Jr. is making its way through the pack. Long, Dark and Brooding is also making his way through the pack too, even if it means a bit of a nudge. The Delta Flyer Jr. takes a knock, but follows him. Not content with just flying through space, the last third of the course involves piloting through a swirly and all the associated unpleasantness. It also means they can't be tracked, which is a hell of a choice when half the racers were at war not long ago. Paris and Balana catch up with the two frontrunners, who just so happen to be alien McBumpy Nose and long, dark and brooding. Balana thinks forcing our way through is the right call, and doesn't care when Paris disagrees. The Delta Flyer Jr. barges through after she does a science to the engines and shields, and places them in the lead. Not for long, though. They're the first to exit the swirly, but the race is called to a halt. There's been an accident. Alien McBumpy Nose's co-pilot is in our sick bay after taking a kaboom to the face. She blames Long, Dark and Brooding for ramming them so many times that their shield's overloaded. We'd best investigate, I suppose. Long, Dark and Brooding doesn't feel he's done anything wrong and blanks the whole thing. To be fair to Balana, she's the one who chooses to admit that they were involved in a bit of a nudge too, though Paris covers for her and says that it wasn't intentional. Alien McBumpy Nose doesn't care about us anyway, saying that her ship was already buggered by that point due to long, dark and brooding, but there may be another answer. Tuvok's in Poirot mode and has found a gizmo on Alien McBumpy Nose's ship, one he says is responsible for the overload. Looks like someone's trying to scupper the whole thing, and the Ambassador admits that they've received other threats from multiple parties who were against the peace treaty that ended their long war. He thinks it's too dangerous to continue, but Alien McBumpy Nose wants the race to carry on as planned. Without her, presumably, as she's no longer got a co-pilot. <laughs> is, is that a plot twist I can smell? Long, Dark and Brooding wants to keep going as well, and the Ambassador agrees to let the race continue. And Janeway wants us to remain a part of it, despite the danger. We're winning, after all. As they leave the meeting, Paris, Bellana, and Alien McBumpy Nose are joined by Kim. He offers congratulations before springing a surprise. He's decided to be Alien McBumpy Nose's new co-pilot. It's within the rules, and he'll repair the ship, too. Alien McBumpy Nose looks decidedly displeased with developments, but has no way to disagree. Yep, that's definitely a plot twist I can smell. In the morning, Bellana and Paris are going over the next section of the course. They also touch upon Balana overruling him in the swirly yesterday, but don't get the chance for a proper argument as Kim arrives. He's repaired their ship and is delighted by Alien McBumpy Nose, enjoying the time he's spent with her. And he's discovered that her co-pilot was just a teammate, meaning she's single. Of course, that also means she wasn't close to the guy who got injured on her ship, just in case you wanted another hint at that plot twist. Rather than the put-down that Kim expects, Paris instead congratulates him on finally finding someone who's real, alive, and available. If there was any doubt left that she's the baddie, that line just torpedoed it. We restart the race, and with the Delta Flyer Jr. still in the lead. As Balana and Paris dance around their relationship problems, Alien McBumpy Nose's ship starts to fall behind. They're having tech problems, which is odd as Kim says they checked everything before leaving. Another alarm calls Alien McBumpy Nose away from the front of the cockpit, just as Kim notes his console is about to explode. Two kabooms for co-pilots on the same ship, it's almost as though there's something more going on. Kim tries to share this idea with Alien McBumpy Nose, but finds it difficult on account of the fact that she's pointing a gun at him. Oh look, Kim's having something happen to him. How rare. 
At least he's not willing to remain passive about this one. A quick slap of the console sends the ship sideways and gives him the chance to grab the gun. Unfortunately, she's disabled the phone so he can't call for help, but he's willing to wait for someone to come along and pick them up. Gee, I wonder why she seemed so intent on not being the one to win the race. The Delta Flyer Jr. is winning the race. Not that you'd know it from the people inside whose bickering has now elevated to passive aggression. It doesn't take long to drop the passive and have a proper row, during which Paris stops the ship. That seems to be of interest to Alien McBumpynose, who managed to convince Kim to watch. Even he can see that there's something more going on now and wants to know what. Alien McBumpynose is forthcoming on the reason why, which is odd for someone who turns out to be a massive bigot who wants things to go back to when species didn't mix with each other. The group of ships spectating at the finish line are a perfect example of exactly what she hates, and a tasty target to boot. Kim suspects an attack, but her interest in the position of the Delta Flyer Jr. suggests the answer might be a bit closer to home. She had plenty of time on Voyager to access it, after all. I suppose it's good that Bellana and Paris are having a relationship crisis then, and might not make it to the finish line at all. Except the crisis seems to be abating. Hell, Paris is even admitting that he has those silly feeling things. Kim's figured it all out now, and to be fair, it's slightly smarter than I gave it credit for. We're only in the race because Alien McBumpynose challenged us, and then provided us with a special bit of kit to make our engine work with a particular fuel. I blame myself for not noticing that they'd mentioned it twice in the episode. Either way, she's rigged that to kaboom and take everything around them with it. Paris's willingness to be open has taken Balana by surprise, as does his claim that he only avoided it previously because he thought she wasn't into that. They make up, as Alien McBumpynose's ship does a science wibbly to them. The phone might not be working, but Kim has figured out a way to send Morse code, something they learned together back in the Captain Proton holodeck programs, a point there for the nod. Kim manages to tell them that the gizmo Alien McBumpynose gave them is rigged, but not soon enough. It's already starting to overload, and spitting out the problem won't stop it from kabooming and killing everybody in the vicinity. Lucky, then, that there's some space fog nearby that Paris says will contain the kaboom, even though they might not survive. Sounds like as good a time as any to propose marriage, and Paris does. For most people, that could be considered insensitive, but Bellana declared her love for him as they were dying in spacesuits, so I'd argue this makes them one all. They reach the space fog and shit out the warp core before scarpering. Kabooms go kaboom and the Delta Flyer Jr. is hit. Back on Voyager, Janeway is pissed off about losing, but stops caring when they feel the shockwave of the kaboom. Maybe they go to check it out, maybe they don't. We aren't told. Bellana and Paris are still alive, though, so that's good, I guess. Paris proposes once more and Bellana this time agrees, a lapse of judgement that we can probably attribute to the toxic fumes currently filling up the cockpit. Bellana and Paris are coasting along on the now mostly repaired Delta Flyer Jr. while sipping celebratory champagne. Paris has proven that he liked it by putting a ring on it, and we leave them to argue over surnames as they fly away. Before we start, no, I didn't notice the wedding ring in the last episode when I watched it, but I did read about it afterwards as I was finishing the script. As a rule, if I don't personally spot something myself during the episode, I tend not to discuss it in the summary. To those saying it was a continuity error and wondering, quite fairly, why the Delta Flyer Jr. was in the last episode when we're only testing it now, the dates mentioned tell us that this story was set before episode 2. We'll presume a production fucky of some kind, but it's not the first time Voyager has shifted things around. It's quite unfortunate that it happened for the two episodes where something noticeable changed after years of no such progression. Well, we'd best talk about that change then, hadn't we? Bellana and Paris are now married. The timing was terrible and his delivery both rushed and offhand, so I suppose we should give some points for it being the most Paris way of doing things. To be fair, this episode is a continuation of the problem both of them have always had, an inability to talk to each other, at least until something life-threatening comes along. Maybe they'll wait until an extinction-level planetary event before renewing their vows. I do wonder quite how much of that is Balana's fault, though. Paris tells her that he didn't think she was into the mushy stuff, which doesn't really gel with her wanting to spend two weeks alone with him. We could put that down to him being terrible with social cues, but I think it's more that he's unable to see them beyond his own desires. Paris may have grown over the past few years, but changing the dickishness of a lifetime is not a quick task. 
But maybe I'm being unfair. Balana had the chance to discuss her doubts about their relationship and didn't. Making that first step on starting the conversation is difficult, but if you're the only person who knows you're unhappy, you're the only person with the power to say something. And leaving it longer and longer only serves to build up the resentment and resignation while cementing the idea that everything's fine in the mind of your partner. Does that feel kind of victim blamey? Well, yes, but that doesn't stop it being accurate. Talking about a problem is the only way to tell if something is born of ignorance or malice. I spent many years not enforcing my own boundaries and suffering as a result. I don't recommend it, especially with people you actually like. Leaving something that you could have fixed in the hope that it resolves itself is a great way of poisoning the whole experience. Elsewhere in the episode, we saw Kim be the victim of a thing happening to him yet again. I mean, okay, he actually dealt with it himself this time, but it was still all in service to other people having the character progression that he isn't getting. I'm largely resigned to his treatment now, but we can still mourn the wasted opportunities. Shall we end on a potential continuity error and try to make it work? While Paris and Bellana are arguing on the Delta Flyer Junior before the restart of the race, she says he was expelled from Starfleet Academy. But we know that he graduated because he had postings. Even if we didn't know about the postings, we're aware that he was a Lieutenant Junior grade because Janeway reinstated him at that rank. On the surface, this sounds like an error, and to be honest, it probably is, but let's be generous and think our way out of it. Maybe they're both true. Maybe he was expelled and readmitted after appeal. It's not difficult to imagine him getting expelled because, well, it's Paris, isn't it? He's a cock. But his dad's an admiral, and one that we know taught at the academy at one point while he was there. His dad may have been sufficiently objective to only give his son a B- in survival strategies, a conversation he had in parturition, but there's a difference between people seeing your son slacking and people seeing your son being a complete fuckwad. We've had nods previously to Starfleet being a bit of a nepotism club, something Janeway alluded to in Counterpoint by suggesting that being on first name terms with admirals allowed her the freedom to not give a shit about the rules. Is it really such a stretch to suggest that Admiral Paris would bend the rules to change a decision about the child for whom he had such high expectations? There you go, writers. You can have that one on me. End of episode. The bastard's married now, too. So it would seem. I presume we are going to stop trying to kill him? That's probably for the best. Any more attempts and we'll end up making Paris a fleet admiral or some shite. You're not suggesting we go back to advertising the Patreon, I hope? Christ, no. These M-bits haven't done that for ages and I don't plan on going back now. Why not? Well, it depends. If you ask me, I'd say it's because he can bollocks. If you ask a psychiatrist, they'll probably tell you this constant self-sabotage was a manifestation of the boss's low self-esteem. Wow. We are doing meta again then, are we? Well, it was either that or think of a plot. What the fuck was that? Sounds like a ship docking. Oh, I guess we're doing meta and a plot then. Woof.